Now what do you mean people are waiting for a new video? Can a guy never work on his computer at home without being bothered? Hello guys, so recently I've been working on various design projects trying to recreate the atmosphere of movies like 2001 A Space Odyssey or Alien from 1979. And one of my first concrete ideas is to build a computer desk that will somewhat look like consoles in these movies, but well combined with at least some degree of practicality. And that is why I've been recently hunting for all kinds of retro things from the 60s, 70s and 80s that will be incorporated into these items. And we're not just talking about finding just the right buttons and lights and switches and meters, but I also want lots of small CRT screens because in many of these movies we see in the spaceships and space stations and all of those consoles and computers, little screens displaying readouts, visual effects, etc. And I'm going to show you two examples in this video of how I'm going to implement that. And just this Sunday I was at a local flea market and I was just hunting for beautiful things from the 60s, 70s and 80s in the hopes that I would find things that could be incorporated into these designs or that could at least serve as props or requisites for that atmosphere that I'm trying to recreate here. So let's take a look at what I got here, polish things a little bit and get them running again if needed. So the things that I got here are a portable television and a children's book, then an old calculator, the headlight from an old Opel Kadett from 1972, a box of technical pens, I guess from the 1980s, and then a car radio from the end of the 1960s, and inside the box more parts for an Opel Kadett from the early 1970s. So we start with the Lenko TV, a German company, and I think it's from the 90s or 2000s. And this is of course not compatible with the 70s retro sci-fi look, but this is not how I intend to use this. The CRT and the electronics will be extracted from this enclosure and then inserted inside a self-made console. But for now, I'm just trying to see if the TV is still functional. Now I got this for seven bucks without a power supply unit and a broken power jack here, as you can see. So I start cleaning this and while doing that, we can see that we have a 50 ohms antenna input and a composite video input with RCA connectors on the back. That means that we have two ways here to connect a Raspberry Pi, for example, to this TV. In the next step, I then unscrew a bunch of screws and I open the enclosure. Here on the side, by the way, you can see the screen adjustment pots. And you have to know that normally it can be dangerous to work on CRT televisions because the tube and lots of capacitors inside can contain dangerous charges. So you have to discharge them safely or let them sit for a very long time. And down here we can see the broken jack. So what we need next is a desoldering pump like this one. And now I can remove the solder and the broken jack, of course. And now it would be time to find out which of these pads here is actually connected to minus and that can be done very easily with a continuity tester on a multimeter. You connect one end of the multimeter, for example, to the chassis ground or to the shield of one of the RCA connectors or the antenna connector, and then you check where you have zero or close to zero ohms. So this here would be minus or chassis ground. But I have no fitting replacement jack, but that doesn't matter because I also don't have the original PSU. So I just connect two wires to these pads then and I close the enclosure again. And now I connect them to my lab power supply, setting it to 12 volts. And the TV is turning on. And this here is a Raspberry Pi, a Raspberry Pi 2 to be more precise. And what we also need is an audio video cable that has a 
four pole, 3.5 millimeter jack on one end. I explained that in detail in my video online with my 1980 TV set. You can find that in the video description and there I explained what exact type of adapter cable you need to do this. But in short, the yellow RCA connector on the other side of the cable is connected to the composite video input of the TV. And after also connecting a keyboard, of course, and a Wi-Fi stick, we can now use this as our computer screen and even go online. And in the meantime, I have actually collected not just one, but a whole assortment of old portable TVs for this exact same purpose. And we'll talk more about all of these in the future, but let me show you one particular beauty right now. And in this case, it will not be modded. It will keep its own enclosure, of course, because it's really kind of a treasure and has high collector's value in my opinion. This Philips Filetta from 1972 is still in working condition, but it only has very old fashioned antenna inputs and that is why I had to hack two wires in here, at least temporarily. And now we can actually use the Raspberry Pi again, but what we need also is an RF radio frequency modulator in Germany HF modulator high frequency modulator and yet again I already explained this in detail in my video online with my 1980 TV set video description. So enough with the TVs then, let's continue with that old radio. And to be precise, it's a Blaupunkt Bremen and well, it came together with a box of parts for the 1972 Opel Kadett, so I think it belonged to that car. But it seems to me that it's a little older, maybe 1968 or thereabouts. And you can see that for example on this label, it states the names of the transistors used and they begin with A, not with B, like A, D, A, C, while German transistors today typically start with a B, like B, C, 556 or something like that. And the A stands for the germanium that was used here. So these are germanium transistors, not silicon transistors. And that tells us this is more like 60s than 70s technology. You can also see that there's a button for L and for M on the front and not for something like U for ultra short wave. So this is an AM radio only and L stands for long wave and M for middle wave, two different frequency ranges. But it's very dirty and dusty. So we clean it out with compressed air and well, we open the enclosure. So I want to turn it on and use the lab power supply for that. 
But first we have to find out about the pin out of the thing. Now this yellow wire here I suspect leads to the plus pole of the car's battery. But before turning it on, I will try to find continuity with my multimeter between, for example, one of the leads of this light bulb here and this wire so that I can be sure that it's actually for the supply voltage. And that works. You can see that it leads directly to the on off switch also. Now these loudspeaker jacks here seem to be just four millimeter jacks as used in banana plugs. And that's also what we're going to use here. And we connect that to a loudspeaker. Well, it seems a little big, but it's the only thing that I have at hand here. And now we can turn on the radio. And yes, there you see that little red light. The switch is working. and we try to find a station on middle wave. And for that I also connect just a piece of wire, like two or three meters long, to the antenna jack. And there we have a French radio station. But in the long wave range, these days here in Germany, I think without a proper antenna, we have no chance of finding any station. But this tells us that the amplifier is working and now we can do a little hack here. See these wires leading directly to the power amplifier section from the volume potentiometer? Well, that tells me that it's very easy to insert a sound signal from another source in here. And I will now just cut this little wire here. Well, and no worries, I'll solder it back on later. And here I can now just insert a cable, we take this audio cable with 3.5 millimeter headphone plugs on both sides. We cut it in the middle, then solder the signal wire to that wire on the volume pot and connect the shield to the chassis ground of the radio. And now we can just connect this 1968 radio Not to my smartphone. To prevent a major eruption. The advantages of nuclear propulsion for surface ship were further conclusively demonstrated when the Enterprise and the Bainbridge joined the 7th Fleet off Vietnam on 2 December 1965, marking the first time that nuclear-powered ships entered combat. So that should tell you that 1968 and 2018 might not be as far apart from each other as some of you might think. And let's get on then with these isographs here or technical pens as they're actually called. And well, isograph or rapidograph, those are just trade names by the German company Rotring. And I got this entire set here for two euros while something like this when it's new might cost 50 bucks or more. So these are technical pens used by engineers and technicians in order to draw technical drawings. And as you've seen earlier in the video, I'm really into that. Well, not in this case technical drawings, but drawing in itself is something that I like to do. And I'm just trying to get some of the ink that came with the box into the isographs and write with it. But as you can see, it's a little um, too light little too pale and that might just be because the ink is so old. So, but you might see these things again in a future video when I have gotten me some new ink. So let's talk about that calculator then. It is an old Casio HR7 with a printer included and I actually bought this calculator just because I think it has just the kind of look that I want. I think this could be in some scene in Alien 1979 sitting on some bench in the Nostromo and only paid two bucks for it. So didn't really matter to me if it still works, but of course we want to see if it does. So I'm opening the battery compartment and of course there are old ruined batteries in here and they probably corroded the contacts. And this is probably why it didn't work anymore and why this person sold the calculator in the first place. So I'm inserting these rechargeable batteries here, but nothing happens. So let's open the enclosure and now again I'm just soldering wires directly to this electrolytic capacitor here that just leads to the supply rail inside and I set the lab power supply to 6 volts this time and we try to get it on. 
And yes, it works. And as you can see, the printer is also moving. But in order to see if I can get that running again, I'll need a little more time and I can't cover that right now. And there is one more item from the beginning that I want to talk about. This book here, Alles was ich wissen will, which means all that I want to know. And it's just a German version of a book that originally came out in the English language under the title Transport Explainers, First Guide to the Universe, Finding Out About Everyday Things, Where Things Come From. And well, while this issue might be from 2000, as a child I had one from the 80s. And if you have children and you want them to turn out just the way I am, then please buy this book. I'm sure you can get it for one or two bucks somewhere, just like I did here. And I just bought this out of sentimentality, by the way, because I had that as a child, but lost it. And I found it again on this flea market. And one thing's for certain, when I was a child at elementary school, I was the only kid around who knew what Skylab was and, well, about the possibility of people flying to other planets in cryogenic suspension while robots watch their vital signs. And if you like this video, and there's way more where that came from, I have so much old stuff, then give the video a like, I have no other way of knowing. And, well, if you like it very much, then you can visit my Patreon and maybe support this channel. See you soon.